All right, guys, here we are. Robert Drysdale. What up, man? How are you? Going on, Elliot. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on, man. Nice sunny in Las Vegas today. It's beautiful out here, man. That's uh, one of the, the good things about Vegas is we get blue skies very often. We got six inches of snow in Denver. <sighs> it's not so far. It's crazy to me, man. Yeah. Same, same uh, you know, same uh, uh, latitude. And, you know, here we are. You know, it's, it's that one hour flight and it's so different. Crazy. So different. Yeah, it's going to snow all week in Denver. Uh, so we were just talking, man, you know, uh, and we'll get into like your story in a little bit, but I'm, I'm leading off everything with like Corona right now, you know, like uh, especially how the jujitsu schools are handling it, you know, and, and what they're doing and, and how they can stay, you know, stay afloat. So what is it that you're doing? Like you have, you have one of the best schools probably in the country uh, at Zenith, Thank you. you know, um, very welcoming, very, uh, very high level. Uh, so what, it, what, it, what do you got going on right now with the Corona? Uh, you know, I think that, you know, pretty much what everyone's got going on. I got, you know, a rotation between Q and a, and, um, you know, to a correction of, uh, to fights. So my students will send me their fights. I'll go over them and point out what they did wrong and what they need to work on. Right. So that way I, I correct the whole group. Uh, the technique has been difficult because it's difficult to correct someone online. You know, it's something that we tried early on, but it, it, it was difficult. I feel like engaging with them more intellectually was, I think we were making more progress than just showing techniques. And there's a diff, there's a, there's a, a, a level of engagement there, but it doesn't really replace the, 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 the touch, you know, like the, the human element, you know, I, I think online is, is a means of communication, but there's still something about face to face, you know, there's something about rolling with someone in person. It feels very natural, very organic and very real. So, you know, I, as I was saying earlier, right before we, we went live, we get the, 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 the crappy parts of BJJ now. We get the warm-ups and the positions that everyone loves to skip. That's all we're Yeah, about. all the black belts show up late for them, right? The black yeah. belts show up late and you're okay with it and the, the browns and below and you're like, yeah, you can't be late, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, with that, like, uh, what is it that you, and we were talking offline about this, you think, you think that the, the community might be in trouble a little bit, depending on if this lasts a little bit, you were saying, explain that a little more. Well, I, I well, when this first started, like I immediately, my, my, my immediate reflex is to look at creative ways of engaging. Like, what can we do that's new? Cause like, to me, difficulty is an opportunity. I've always looked at it that way. Like any kind of hardship that comes my way is, is a blessing in disguise because it's an opportunity to, to improve on. It's like someone who passes my guard. That's a good thing. It might frustrate you, you know, it might be a blow to your ego, but that's the guy that's going to take you to the next level. Right. So, you know, hardship in life should be looked at the same way. It's someone putting you in a triangle. That's all it is. But I, for the life of me, I cannot think of any creative way of engaging in jujitsu. Like I'm thinking, I'm still thinking like, what can we do that's different? What can we do that's real? What can we do that is going to be, that is going to replace that feeling of being on the mats. And I can't think of anything. I'm pretty creative when it comes to this stuff, but it's what we, we have, you know, and we're missing precisely what makes BJJ so appealing. It's not the technique. That's what people miss. They think it's the self-defense. They think it's the fact that BJJ is so efficient on the ground. They think that it's all these cool techniques. That's not what keeps people coming. I've been in gyms my whole life. What keeps people coming back is the, the community that we build. Right, the fact that your friends are in the gym combined with the endorphins of rolling, right? You get a kick out of, you get high off of rolling, win or lose, you become addicted to those feelings, right? That that that, that feeling of being tired and chatting with your friends on, on on the mats after we roll. So these things are all missing. So I think that I worry about a long term effect of the concept of social distancing. You know, because people are going to be going to be germaphobes more than ever now. Like, don't touch that person. Don't shake hands. Don't come too close. I worry that's going to be a long time cultural effect on, on society. And, you know, if there's a sport that's going to be hurt, you know, if this, you know, hopefully this is, doesn't, you know, come to fruition. But if it is the case, I think BJJ would take a hit because... BJJ is a very viral prone sort of endeavor. Like you're going to be very in each other's face, breathing in each other's face. Right. So it's even the if the antithesis, corona, it's the antithesis yes. of social distancing. Yes, it is. Exactly. So as a result, we're going to be very, I worry there's going to be a cultural backlash, you know, and BJJ will take a bit of a hit. It was on the way up. I, I think this is going to be a little dip, you know, hopefully we'll pick up eventually. And, um, 
but it, my passion for jujitsu doesn't change. I think that the real passionate people, the people that love it for what it is, they're not going anywhere. But I think that the people that are going by trends, you know, the fashionists, like those will, we might lose some of those in the long run, short, mid, long and long term. You know? I, I could see it. I could see it. Um, it could possibly get some of the people that shouldn't be running schools out of the, out of the industry as well, though. Hopefully. <laughs> right. Like there's definitely that, right. There's definitely some people yeah. that refuse to evolve and refuse to, to learn, you know, like, like, look, we're both old, you know, we're both out of the game a little bit and older, right. Like we're not at the top of the comp- competitive scene, yeah. but, <clears throat> uh, but we're staying active. Yeah. Right. Like, like, uh, and I don't like to bring it up too much here, but uh, like you, like when you were, I know Gordon came at you a little bit for a while and you, I mean, I thought your point was perfect. You were like, look, man, I run a school. I do all these seminars. Of course, you're, I'm almost 40. You, you, you are the top of the game right now. And I haven't competed in a decade. What, what, what you beating me in a match? What does that say? Right? Like, you know, but that doesn't mean that you're not in the school learning and still progressing. And, and I think sometimes people can get that mixed up sometimes where they're like, Oh, he's out. So he's out. I think that, you know, your lessons in BJJ, they change over time. I, I think that the immediate lesson is, you know, technique and winning tournaments and that's your immediate challenge. And, you know, that's what motivates you. Right. There's, right. there's a large degree of vanity that goes into that, you know, and I think that, it's part of, you know, of, of life is to be vain. You know, there's nothing wrong with vanity per se. I think we all possess a degree of it and there'd be something wrong with you if you didn't possess it. But if that, if that becomes who you are, like, you know, the, the, the person you mentioned, he's, he's the extreme, you know, there's something missing there. Like it's clearly something that he has to feel that he has to be putting other people down to feel good about himself. Right. And that's, it's a desperate, the desperation for, for the applause, the constant applause is the addiction to it, right? That, that right there to me is very anti jujitsu because jujitsu, even though it has this moment of vanity, you know, with time, you learn humility. You learn that there's, there's a lot more to the art than just technique. And I feel that I'm learning more about jujitsu now than I was when I was training, you know, full time and competing full time. And it's not technical, um, things per se, but I'm learning how to be a better coach. I'm learning how to run a gym better. Like I'm, I mean, I've learned so much over the last few years, you know, they're just different kind of lessons. So your journey changes, you know, and there's an element of business in there. You know, I think it's part of what we do. You can't be a coach unless you know how to run a business. There's an element of leadership that it's not something that jujitsu teaches you the technical aspect. That's something that you learn either because you have a gift, you know, some people are naturally, you know, inclined for certain uh tasks other others have to learn the hard way but they're all learning so to say that bjj's learning curve is interrupted when you retire when you're not so active in the competition scene is misunderstanding the potential of jiu-jitsu i 100 percent agree uh <clears throat> the the leadership aspect especially right because when you when you stop becoming the top dog right in your school that, yeah. that's a change right? That, that's a change. And that's a change that comes for everybody. Yeah. Right? Like, like whether it's you, whether it's me, like, uh, I was just thinking the other day, man, I'm, uh, I've only been able to train twice this year because I've had a concussion, right? Well, I was training with one of my fighters and I was no gi, I was baby bowling to his back. Right. And I was, and I was coming up and you know, no gi, you don't have the best grips. Right. Yeah. So he spun around like spinning wheel kick and boom in my head, like spinning wheel kick right to the side of my head, basically. So I've literally trained twice since January and, uh, and I'm, and it made me realize kind of what you were saying, like, look, I could probably keep up with most of my fighters. still. I'm not quite out of there, but the, the risk of it for me. So can yeah. I let, can I let that back off? Right. And how have you handled that? You know, because that, because you were like, look, like comparing me to you is crazy because you're, you're a multiple time world champion. And so like, what, what has that been like for you? Um, it's, it's been difficult, but good. Like I mentioned earlier, like that when you get caught in a triangle, you may hate it, you know, but it's what makes you better. <laughs> right. It's you. And, and I'm, when I say triangle, I'm talking about the, the feats in life, uh, the falls, you know, and those things really are blessings in disguise. You have to embrace them. And, and no matter how much they suck, you, you have to learn how to turn them around to your favor. Um, you know, to me, one of the things that was so fascinating about jujitsu and still is that it's so real in the sense where you can't talk your way into beating you actually have to beat me in practice, right? right? So to me, 
how do I become the alpha dog in the gym? Oh, it's simple. I just got to make everyone tap. It's, it's simple. It really isn't complicated. You know, accomplishing that is more complex, but the idea there's, there's not a lot of layers to it. It's just like, Oh, beat everyone, you know, and then everyone's going to respect you because you're the person who's able to tap everyone. And for a long time, I was that guy in the gym, <clears throat> you know, obviously with age and then, you know, your injuries and then you train less and then you start, life kicks you in the teeth and you got to do more of this and more of that. And, you know, all of a sudden you're not as active as a 22 year old. And I can see some of my 19, 20 year olds catching up to me and they're like purple belts. And I'm like, man, this guy in like one year, I, there's, you know, it's not just, a, it's not a technique. It's the, it's the, 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 the athletic ability, the speed, the reflexes, the timing, the fact that they're training twice a day and you're training two, three times a week. If, yeah. you know, because I got herniated disc on my neck, I got no meniscus left on my knee. So standing up, I got to brace my knees like an old man to stand up. Right. <laughs> there are all these things that are happening. And how do you become the alpha dog now that you can't beat, you know, you can't beat everyone in the gym anymore. You think I can beat Philippe Andrew in practice? No, I can't. I can give him a hard time. And that's doing my very best, but I can't beat him. I'm not, I'm not delusional, you know. I, and that's five, on the six. days when you train. Like if you tried to train every day, you, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be, you'd be, you'd be nothing. He's twenty. Yeah, exactly. You can't, you know. And you have to be realistic about it. It's a very painful experience, especially being someone you know competitive like myself, who's been in the fight scene for so long, and I'm used to being that guy who's able to beat people on the mats. And all of a sudden, you see like your your superpowers being taken away from you one by one. And then it forces you to see what, what other superpowers do I have, right? What else that I can do that I can improve on? And then leadership kicks in. Like you learn, okay, now I actually have to learn how to be the boss without actually having to be people on the mats. And you look at some of the best coaches, you know, they're these like little unassuming guys like Zeha Giola, Draculinu. You know, they don't look like big threatening powerhouses. They look like just, they're like, you know, they, you know they're good at jiu-jitsu, but they, that's not what they're known for. Yet they're able to, you know, build champion after champion after champion. And I'm looking at those guys. I and mean, this guy knows something that I don't know. This guy knows some jujitsu technique. And I'm not talking about sweeps here that I am missing. I've been missing that my whole life. I didn't even know that was important. Oh, shit. It is important. It's super important. In fact, that's the skill I need to master for as long as I'm training jujitsu because physically it's downhill from here. So you learn these skills, right? And it's a whole new set of challenge. It is jujitsu. It's just, it's jujitsu 2.0. Yeah. It's yeah. Because I mean, like, like you mentioned, Jack Galeno, he, he's not Baron Bowling. He's 55 years old. Yeah. Right? Like the Baron Bolo came around when he was 50. Like he didn't, yeah. he didn't start inverting. <laughs> right. Like, so, yeah. and he, so he, how, how is he teaching his students? And he still, well, is. because he, he, this is what students don't miss out on. Like, this is like immaturity plays a role here because I think that if you're a more mature person, you get this. What makes a champion has, little to do with how many moves your instructor is teaching you. That really isn't it. That helps. I think that's, that's a, it's a, it's a flavor. It's an ingredient in the recipe, but like it has to do with the social dynamics you develop inside the gym. What, what is the dynamic in the room? Is it a competitive one? Is it a healthy one? Is there a leader? Is that leader pushing people to excellence? Is it, because I'll give an example. When me and Damian Mai or Lucas Leach would roll, if you didn't know us and you walked in the room, you would think we hated each other you would think we hated each other because we're going to war like, man, it's on. Like, I'm not losing you. No way. You're not scoring a point on me. It was competition every day. But as soon as it was over, it was over. All right. How do you nurture that kind of an environment where you can keep it healthy off the mats? Because if it's unhealthy off the mats, what's on the mats doesn't work. Right. So you have, you have this challenge to create a, an environment that is, that is, does justice to the word competition but without becoming a poisonous environment. Because I've seen that as well. It becomes so competitive that people are literally, they hate on each other. And then you don't want to go to a place like that. You lose a community, which is what kept, you know, that's the social glue, man. That's what keeps us coming back is the fact that we love our friends. We love our coach. And it's not easy to nurture that environment because it's so competitive and because BJJ tends to breed such immature people because these kids go straight from high school into the BJJ lifestyle. So they, they never really learn any responsibility. You get people in their thirties who, you know, may or may not have a bank account. So it, it's not always easy. And that's a skill, man. It's not something, it's not something that should be looked at lightly. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an ingredient. It's a very important ingredient to create a champion. It has nothing to do with technique, but if you don't have that, I don't care how talented you are. You're not making it because you need a healthy place to train. Yeah. And you need a, 
you need that community to, to rely on because there's going to come a day like you and I are talking and there's been world champions, right? There's been plenty of world champions that have been forgotten because how they were when they came up was not the right way. You know, they had all the talent in the world. They, they, they won the worlds and they did all these great things as a young person. But then once, once their day passed, now they, they've got nothing, right? They've got nothing because they, they shit on everybody all, all the way along the way, you know? So it will be a very interesting thing to see what happens with this generation where it is the internet shit talking generation of, of jujitsu a little bit. And, and it's a very lonely generation too, man. I think we've like, the internet has made us more isolated <sighs> instead of bringing us together. Uh, you know, depression's on the rise, anxiety's on the rise. Like everyone has created an expectation for themselves to become a rock star, but not everyone can be a rock star. So that expectation comes with, like, there's a price to it, right? Like the, the addiction to the applause and all that. And it's something we all suffer from, myself included. But I think that it's something that we, that is detrimental to our health. It is detrimental to jujitsu. It's detrimental to everything that we all behave that way. You know, we ought to learn what, what are the deeper lessons that we learn from jujitsu and let those guide us, right? What, are, what is the lessons of humility, of camaraderie, of respect, right? Of being okay, completely happy with yourself while you enjoy your jujitsu journey without the need for an applause, right? Like I don't need someone telling me that I'm good at jujitsu to, you know, be uh, uh, aware of what I've done in jujitsu. Like if the fact that someone applauds me or acknowledges that or not should not affect me in any way, shape or form because I'm not dependent on anyone to be completely fine and happy with myself, right? And if I am dependent on someone else, to make me feel good, then I'm an addict. You know, like you're looking for external factors to feel good and you shouldn't have to do that, right? And this is what the generation is entirely missing on. And I think it's going to cause a lot of problems in the future. It already is. But I, I, that's something I learned from jujitsu, man. Like you, you know, you should enjoy your time on the mask for what it is. And if there's a reward, that's great, but that's not why you're training, right? And you shouldn't let that be, that reward or the pursuit of the reward, you know, define you because you can't be just that, just the person who wins medals or just the person who is obsessed with attention. You have to be looking at improving on yourself on a much deeper level. How did you figure this out? Because this is, this is, I mean, it sounds so simple, right? I mean, it is very simple. Um, the, the, the great scholars of the world, uh, religious leaders, everyone's been saying this for, for millennia. Uh, but it, it takes something from us to figure it out. Like, because you were a champion, right? Like, so like, cause you have to have that drive as well, right? Like you can't, you have to have that drive of no, like what you were saying with you and Lucas Leach and Demi and Maya, I'm going to be the best. You aren't getting anything, you, right? Like, so how, how did you figure out both ends of the same coin? And they are exactly, you put it perfectly. You just answer the question. They're the both faces of the same coin and there's no right and wrong. But this is, these are processes like, you know, like being fiercely competitive and vain and having a massive ego and like, you know, killing yourself to be the alpha male in the room. I think there's a place for that. And that's part of the journey. But at some point, you know, you're, you're supposed to be learning lessons along the way. And if you don't, then you're failing to learn the lessons because they're there, you know, but to, to answer you, like, I didn't figure any of this out. Like, I'm just... I'm just, you know, picking the brain of like smarter people, you know, wiser people than myself. And you go to the ancients and they've been saying it, like you said, and like smarter people than me have been saying it for centuries. And if they're saying it, you can go back to, you know, pick your, you know, pick your period. There's like some great mind is saying more or less exactly that, you know, there's, there's a period for the fire and there's a period for the, the call. There's a period for the, for reflection, you know, and, and this is where uh, a jujitsu coach needs to acquire wisdom to, in order to be a better coach because a coach that doesn't have this cannot, it's not fulfilling the role completely. In my opinion, I think that with the lessons that come in jujitsu, it should come some wisdom at some point. Right. And these are the things that I like to teach my students. Ironically, it's hard to teach a 20 year old because they don't understand it. And I wouldn't have either. It's a, it's a time thing, you know, but I think that the role model and the, 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 the North is there. Like we have a North as to what our behavior should be. doesn't mean I'm perfect or you're perfect, but we have a North and we stick to that North and hopefully people at some point are going to look at that and they're going to go, I'm learning something from this. Maybe this is the next step in my jujitsu evolution. Right. But the jujitsu community needs, you know, this sort of reference, I believe, because we've gone in a very, very strange direction over the last few years. Yes, I would agree with you. You know, it's, uh, 
it's kind of weird because it's, it's at the same time that money got added to the sport, right? Like people can actually make a living now, you know, like you can, you know, if you, you do fight to wins, you do all these other tournaments and you can, you can travel and just do jujitsu and do all right. You know? Um, Here's the thing Elliot though. Like it's, we, I, we all like money. Let's not be hypocrites. Yeah, right? sure. I like money. But when did you start training? What, what year did you begin? 99. 99. I started 98. So we started around the same time. How much money was there in the sport? None. None. Is that why you do? Is that why you started jujitsu, Elliot? No. No, you started for a different reason. You started because you loved it. That's a that's a noble reason. That's a, that's a, the, the the right motivation. You had the right motivation. We had the right motivation. Money didn't make you make jujitsu better. It made it more popular, and that is good. But at the same time, I think it's made it worse in a lot of ways. Same thing with MMA. Right. I remember the days where like MMA was pure. Like Randy Couture was fighting for fifteen hundred dollars. No complaint. No, he just loved it, man. Chuck Liddell, give him 300 bucks and he'd fight. <laughs> you know, you know sure. it's, it's gotten better in, in some ways, but I feel like it's lost its purity. And, you know, as much as we all like money, like I said, let's not be hypocrites, but that should not be the sole motivation in life, right? That is a motivation, but by itself, it's not fulfilling. I don't think it is. I, you I, give me all the money in the world. I would not trade it for my jujitsu medals. I no, really wouldn't. I, I, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it for my students. Uh, you know, somebody asked me this the other day, a couple months ago, I was uh, on vacation with some friends and he was like, man, if I put a hundred million dollars in front of you right now, uh, but you can't go back to Denver, you can't go back, you know? And I was like, and I was like, well, can I just fly everybody here with that hundred million? He's like, no. <laughs> That's he's like, a lot of have, money. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you have to leave that life. And I was like, well then no, yeah. fuck off. You know, yeah. there's, there's no way, there's no way that I would trade my students for money because that's there it's you know make some money you know and and you know and it, people shouldn't misunderstand because we th- we tend to think in absolutist terms you know right. like you either like money or you don't like no i no. like it, but like it's not it you know if i ever told you that is that what i'm thinking about when i'm putting my head in the pillow every night if there's something wrong with you that's all you think about like if that defines you and that's what you're thinking about before you go to bed every night well, there's something like very, very wrong with, with your motivation and your North. Like you, do you, think um, that's you know, because I, we're, do you think that's because we're lucky that we are okay? Like what about somebody who's dead? Like, you know, like, uh, you know, somebody born dirt, dirt poor. And like, literally yeah. just like just trying to put the food on the table every day. Right. Cause they might 100%. be, thinking, you know, so what, you know, but, but their motivation is different. Ali. They're not talking about a luxury and accumulating wealth. They're talking about survival and the survival kicks in like everything else takes a backseat. When survival kicks in, morals, ethics, like you, this conversation right here, jujitsu, that goes in the back burner, man. Survival first, right? But it's not what, you know, we, we live fairly well in the U.S. You know, I mean, other countries can't always say that, but life here, and I, I've, I've lived in Brazil, like I've seen poverty to an extent that I have never seen in the U.S. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that re- what really is motivating people to pursue money, you know, almost to the point of like recklessly where you completely lose track of any other value um, is like this, this ambition we all have to live like rock stars. And, you know, modern technology in the 21st century has allowed such a degree of comfort that it is in a way like we kind of live better than kings did 500 years ago. We really do, actually. Like sure. I have more comfort than a king did. Poor people in the U.S. have more comfort than a king did 500 years ago. You know, so it's gotten to the, but like, it's like we're addicted to it. Like the more we have, the more we want it. And at the same time, we lose, like we miss out on little things that are very important to our will. Yeah. Like there are other little things, you know, like sometimes like we get, you know, we, it's like there's an excess of, of, you know, we live in the age of the extremes, you know, like it, everything has to be an excess, the excess of, you know, you know, pleasure, the excess, everything has to be pushed to its limits. Right. And we, like the other day I had to clean my pool and I never cleaned my pool, man. I actually liked it. It's crazy, but actually, and it was peaceful, man. It was quiet. I tend to have the music on. No one was calling me and I have my phone on me Something like 15 minutes, you know, maybe 20. And I'm just cleaning my pool, you know, like, oh, this is not, you know, and I think that we're become so, I'm not saying I want to clean pools for a living. Please don't misunderstand me. But I think that, you know, there's a balance in things that we should look for. We should look for balance in life. And that includes physical work, right? It includes intellectual work. It includes studying. It includes reading. It includes training. It includes having good people in your life. And like, I, you know, I, I see that just that people just desperate for, you know, more and more, and they're looking in the wrong places. Like, that's my impression, you know, and uh, it's cliche to say, but we're going to, you're going to find that peace and happiness in family and friends. 
you know, little small things like walking my dog, man, that makes me so happy. It's one of my it's favorite crazy. things. It's, 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 I, it's insane. But like my dogs just make me so happy. I'm just walking my dogs in the sun, my shirt off, enjoying the beautiful that weather here in Vegas, chatting to Elliot Marshall. And this makes me happy. But I don't have, I don't, I don't need a mansion for that or a yacht, you know? You need nothing. You need, right? It's so, the, the things that truly make you happy are so simple. Yeah. You know, I had the same experience the other day washing my car. Like I hadn't, like my, uh, my friend taught me how to, like he used to wash cars when we were kids at like a professional place. So he taught me how to do it. And I just washed my car for an hour, you know? And I was like, man, this is really nice. And it was <laughs> nice. It was nice to just have the time. It was, you know, and I was like, yeah. I think I need to make the time a little more because I really yeah. enjoyed this. It was really peaceful. Yeah. You know, you know uh, I did, I had some like Japanese that, uh, that I met over that when we did the documentary and we interviewed like the, some of the, the, the coaches at Kosin Judo mm -hmm. from uh, Kyoto University. We became friends with them and they came over and uh, they brought this, uh, I think it's called Shodo, which is Japanese calligraphy, okay. right? And they were practicing, man. They're in the house and they're sitting in the kitchen practicing. These are like, they're like in their mid twenties. They're not like 90 years old or anything, man. They're like their mid twenties and they're practicing calligraphy. And I'm like, what are you doing, man? I'm like, oh, this is, I think it's called Shodo. And I'm going, and they're showing me. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Can you do jujitsu? I wanted him to do jujitsu. He did. It looked absolutely beautiful. I kept it, right? And then I go, can I try? And he goes, yes, of course. Man, it's so much harder than it looks, by the way. It's way hard. I, I mean, <laughs> it, there's so much skill to doing a kanji, you know, like drawing a kanji or, you know, writing a kanji with a brush. There's so much skill to it. It's crazy, Elliot. Like, you have to try it one day. And I found myself doing that for the next three or four hours. Like, I couldn't stop. Like, I, I must have, like, tried to write jujitsu down, like, 20 to 30 times, if not more, and I couldn't get one right. But, man, it was, like, it was a very pleasurable experience. I really enjoyed it. Like, he gave, he ended up giving me, a, like, the, 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 the brush and everything else I needed to, to actually continue to practice Shodo. But it's, like, very hard to practice without a coach because you don't even know what you're doing wrong. Right, right. But, uh, it, you know, like, little things like that. I'm not. You know, it, it's not an extreme, man. Like not, not everything has to be an extreme. It's every now and then, once in a blue moon, like do something like wash your car, man, like clean your pool, you know, learn how to play a musical instrument. And like that right there holds a value that you're not going to find in, in a yacht or in a mansion. You know, there's a, there's a Brazilian poet that I like just to finalize my thought. And it's called, if you read Portuguese, it's a must read. Like if you're Brazilian and you've never read this, don't count just like throw your passport away you're not a true brazilian okay? <laughs> it's called marti vida severina by joan cabral de melo neto and he experiences only pain and suffering throughout his whole life right that's all there is in the world and long story short at the end of the poem he's contemplating suicide like there's no way out like this is miserable like life is just pain and you know when he's about to throw himself off the bridge someone comes along and goes tries talking him out of it and he goes but man there's no life and then he goes the life you're looking for doesn't exist. There are only patches of life. He uses that term, patches of life, right? You get like little glimpses of like true happiness and pleasure that may not last forever, but like those little things, they, they, they keep us going, right? They are what make life, you know, valuable and, and worth living. Things like, you know, hugging your child or, you know, enjoying time on the mats with your, your friends or after you roll, you try to kill each other. Next second, you're like chit-chatting about, you know, life and whatever. So these things are more valuable than people realize. They're the only things that you're going to have at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like cool. no one's, no one's counting your medals when, when you're dying, right? <laughs> you know, like every, no one, you, like the richest of the rich, when they get, when they pass, like, they're like, man, I should have spent more time with my kids, my wife, my family, this, you know, like, so that's, uh, that's, you know, what? I, I listen to them, man. Like people don't listen to old people. I love listening to old people, man. When, when we did that documentary with the grandmasters, uh -huh. I had these like off, you know, off camera conversations with every single one of them. And I'm just asking because I see myself, like I'm looking at these guys in their eighties with a red belt and I'm like, that's me in 40 years. That's, sure. that's, that's me, right? That's you, Elliot. That's you in 40 years. You're that guy. And I'm thinking, what am I going to be like? What, what's life like? Because he, at one point, was an MMA fighter. At one point, he was a comp you know, competitor who fell in love with jiu-jitsu and whatnot. Where is he at now? And, you know, man, there was this peace about these guys. It was just beautiful, man. It was beautiful to watch. You know, it was very, very completely content. I think the storm was completely over. There was no storm. 
it was all peace. They were super happy about themselves. So I'm asking, like, I'm asking these questions, exactly what we're talking about. And the answer is more or less exactly what we're talking about. It's yeah. I might spend more time with family, man. Like enjoy the little moments. Not everything is about money and winning. And, you know, when I look back at my jujitsu journey, my, everyone always asks, what's your best memory in jujitsu? And everyone always assumed it's like ADCC 2007. Right. And I'm like, that one is there, you know, that's a good memory, but the best memories are me, like me in the back of the van with my friends traveling to Rio de Janeiro to compete, farting, you know, doing stupid stuff, you know, like just making fun of each other the whole way there and sleeping and, you know, and just sleeping on the mats when we got to the, 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 the to Rio de Janeiro, like stuff like that. It was, those are the most valuable memories I have in Jiu Jitsu. The, the, where there's another person attached to it. Yeah. It's not you alone, right? It's not your victory. Right. It's, there, yeah. there's, there's, it's a story where there's another person attached to the story. I know what mine is. Mine's with my wife, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah, man. I was, I, my, mine is, uh, it was, it was 2006. Yeah. 2006 at the Tijuca tennis club. Okay. Uh, classic. Classic. Yeah. And, uh, I lost in, uh, my, the open class in the quarterfinals to this guy who he just like, spider guarded me and put me down, like put, put my shoulder down, got an advantage and then just held on. Right. Like yeah. no, no more after that. And definitely, definitely some, some gringo going on. Right. Like, you, you know what it was like, but you got a little yeah. more accepted. You know, we were Brown. I was a Brown belt. And then I knew I had him as my second match in my weight class the next day, you know? So I'm like, God damn, he's going to do the same fucking thing. And I'm just up all night thinking about what I'm going to do. Like, what am I going to do different? And then finally it hits me. Like it hits me at three in the morning. My wife's sleeping next to me. I wake her up. I fucking tell her what I'm going to do. Right. Yeah. And then that the next day comes and I do it. And then you just see this white gringo blonde chick jumping up and down in the stands in the Tijuca tennis club. And I'm like, sit down, baby, sit down. Right. Like, and it's, it's not the wind, like the wind, the wind was no, cool, no. but it was the thing between me and her, you know, it, only you two understand. No yeah. one else. It's a it's yeah. special because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to everyone. It's, yeah. it's, it's like a very special moment between two people. I know you're talking right. about it. It's like, oh, you want a match, who cares? And you like, yeah. it wasn't the finals, it wasn't anything. It was like the second round match, right? Yeah. Like, you know, so it's, it's the people that make it happen, right? It's the people and you've been, uh, and you've been able to take this to so many places, bro. Cause now like you're a commentator, like you have the AC, you have the ACB, you commentate all the flow grappling. How have you transitioned like to, to that part? Like how have you, you've done such an amazing job and I'm actually talking to Braulio tomorrow, you know, and, and he's, and you guys are almost partners sometimes in your commentating. So how have you switched to that part of the jujitsu journey for you? Um, uh, you know, it was, it was an extension, I guess. Like I, I got asked to replace someone, you know, and then commentate on the, the first or maybe the second ACB in LA. And I took, ah, sure, I'll give it a go. You know, it can't be that hard. And I ended up, you know, made people like it and it just kind of, it happened very naturally, but it's, it's a skill too, like any other, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. part of the jiu-jitsu journey. I think I'm happy to say that I've lived, experienced jiu-jitsu MMA from many different angles as a fighter, as a coach, as a gym owner, uh, as a commentator, I work as a manager now too. So a little bit of everything, I'll put all these hats on and that's, that to me makes the journey more, more fun. You know, if you always do the same things, it's like reading the same books over and over. There's value to it, but you're, you know, you gotta, you gotta broaden the, the, the horizon as much as possible. That's how I've always looked at things. Um, but it's been it's been a fairly easy transition, man. I, I I like talking about fighting, like some of like some of the things I'm not so good at, you know. Like I'm I'm more of the creative type. I'm not the most organized individual. So like sometimes I go through my my desktop, my computer, and like it takes me like 90 minutes just to organize those files alone. You Dude, know, I had like, my email like under that. control for a while, you know, yeah. and then COVID came and motherfucker. Yeah. You know, I, I kept my email so controlled until this. And now I'm like every, every week I'm like, Oh God, I got to clean my email. out. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it, you know, it takes like a certain kind of personality. You get that OCD personality. I'm not yeah. that guy. I'm the opposite of that. Right. So like some skills that I have to really have to reshape myself. Like it, it's funny cause I've never discipline has never been a bigger, has never played a bigger role in my life than now. It's harder if people wouldn't believe me, but like, Oh, but before you had to train twice a day, that was easy. Easy. 
that was fun. <laughs> it was not hard. <laughs> People think it's hard. It's not hard. Discipline is like learning how to do all these things that you absolutely hate. Like, I don't, you think I, I want to like run Facebook campaigns and like Google ads? Like, that's not fun. You know, you think I want to do payroll? You think I want to do that stuff? Like, no. I, mean, I didn't sign up for that when I started training jiu-jitsu. I just wanted to armbar people. Right. You know, and here I am like doing all these things that I absolutely hate. But, you know, someone's got to do them. So it's, it's, it's discipline is, is more necessary than ever now. I feel you, right? I feel you. Yeah. Because, you know, we have, especially now, right? Because, I mean, dude, I don't want to apply for loans. <laughs> right. I don't, I, I don't, <laughs> right. I like, know. I'm like, what am I doing? And you got to read the page. Like, you're like, what is this? You know? Yeah. So I don't even know what to do with those fucking loans. Like, whereas, you know, like, I'm like, man, I don't want, like, I mean, like, I guess if it's going to be a grant, I'll take it. You know, right, right. But you have to pay. It's that what out. it should be, man. It's yeah. what it should be. Like it's messed up. Like, like a loan sounds like a great idea. It really isn't because you got to pay it. Like your your students aren't going to pay the months that the ones that cancel. You're not getting that money, but you're still going to have to pay. You know, for the loan that you're getting to cover that hole. So yeah, um, I like. Uh, yeah, I mean, like the grant is the way I see it is in 2008 we bailed out all the banks. Right, they messed up. We bailed them out. The COVID thing is something no one is responsible for. Like, if there's someone that should take the hit, I'm going, well, let the banks take the hit. They got the most amount of money, right? Like, we've bailed them out before, right? Like, mortgages on, you know, uh, no one pays mortgage for two, three months. And that means you don't have to pay rent in your school in case you don't own the building. So, that would be a way to really, truly help small businesses and let the banks take. Of course, no one in Congress is going to have the balls to even suggest that. That'll be the end of your political career if you just mention that. But... You know, I mean, there's there. I'm hoping for the some 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 level of uh, you know SBA help that should be you know give us a little time to you know get on our feet and stay afloat for the next two or three months while this lasts. For sure, no, no, for sure, and ho hopefully it's only two to three months, right? That's the that's yeah. the thing, and the thing that people have to re also realize with this, uh, we you might not be able to open it full bore again. Right, like you might, you're gonna have to pay attention to your schedule, your staffing, and all of that stuff, you know, so that you're because of what you said in the beginning. Like everybody might not come back. Yeah, you know, like your diehards are gonna come back probably, right? Like, but you know, like that that crop of people under a year, man, that's a lot of people. It will be a couple of years for for the gym to recover. Right. Completely. I think a year or two for right. everyone to go back to normal, right? Whatever normal is. But, um, you know, it's it what I, I think I might, you're right. Like I might have to take some, I cut my, some of my classes back. My lease expires in December. I might look for a smaller location. That's possible. Like I have a big location here. Like, you know, I'm open. <laughs> funny story. I just signed a lease to open a gym in Henderson like a week before the lockdown. Perfect okay. time. <laughs> story of my life. Say? Well, I'm still in an abated months, you know, so I got to, okay. you know, a little more, you know, leeway there, but eventually it's going to kick in and the landlord just wants to get paid and I don't even have the gym open. So how can I even, so these are all, all things are going against me, but I, I meet this with a smile on my face. Like that's always my attitude is bring it. Like there are moments where I want to despair and then I want to go and, you know, you want to sink into this dark hole and then you go, nah, man, he just, it's just someone that put me in a triangle. That's all it is. Yeah, man. Hell, it's always jiu-jitsu, right? Uh, and it answers all the questions. Any question in life you got, jiu-jitsu will answer it. It's never not answered it for me, right? And it never lies. It ne yeah. that's, I mean, that's for me, that's the beauty of it, is that it answers the questions and it never lies. And I have to, there's no, there's no wondering. And even like today, may, you know, like you're, you're a world champion, right? You are, you are the best in the room. And especially when you were competing right at the highest level you could have a bad day someday and some brown belt could come in and beat you that day yeah and that's the truth today yeah you know and that's the truth today yeah and, you know? and and it's always you know it's the beauty of it is that it's a reality check because you can yeah. get overconfident too and you're thinking oh no one can beat me and you put your guard down and you're right and then that's happened to me like you know a guy that's not supposed to beat you beats you in practice right and it's it's a reality check and you know th this is these lessons if you if you can have the, the wisdom to translate them into life, man. It teaches you so much about just about everything. Uh, yeah, I agree, man. Like picking yourself back up and meeting hardship head on. You know, you don't quit jujitsu because you got tapped. You come back stronger the next day, right? 
Yeah, for sure. The mat, the mat teaches, I can't think of a lesson that the mat doesn't teach. It teaches every single lesson. You know, me and, uh, me and, uh, Dave, like, uh, um, we, we, we talk about this with David Avalon and yep. we talk about how, you know, the mats are, you know, really are our ultimate teachers. I know it's cliche to say this, but you know, this is a place where it's hard to find, it's hard to find anything you're going to do in life. that's going to be as complete as jiu-jitsu. And we're so biased. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know you're going to agree with me, but like, I know you're biased, <laughs> but it's at the same time, I have a hard time finding something that's so physical, emotional, and intellectual at the same time. Because there, for example, if you're a sprinter, if you're a swimmer, it's very physical. I think there's a lot of concentration that goes on, but it doesn't compare to jujitsu as far as emotions go. Having someone trying to beat you technically, not even close, right? Like it's hard to think of something you're going to do in life that's going to be you know, like encompassing so many different aspects of our being. And, you know, it, it is, you have to, you have to be a brainiac to be successful in this sport. You can't be like, you have to be able to, you know, foresee and, and uh, you know, predict events and outcomes of certain strategies. It's highly physical, obviously, right? One of the most difficult things you can do is, is grapple. And, you know, and it's very emotional too, because you have someone across the mats trying to choke you out, man. That's, we got used to it. But when you think about it, that's, there's a reason why most people are terrified of their first class. You, know? you go through the life and death struggle. And, and the last piece of it that I, that I always like to add I, is, is I have to take care of you. Like I'm yeah. going to try to kill you and you're going to try to kill me when we train, but we have to, we have to do it in a way where we love each other. Yeah. Right. We have to, you have to take care of another human being. Their life is in your hands and yours is theirs. I say that jujitsu is one of the few things in life you'll ever do or fighting for that matter, where both altruism and selfishness coexist in perfect harmony because perfect. the math is a place it's, you would think that they're polar opposites. How can they coexist? Well, they do. In jujitsu, you have to be altruistic because you have to watch out for your partners because it's A, the right thing to do, and B, you need them to be healthy. Even, right. your, even your competitors, Hajar needed Shanji and Jacare. Of course. Right? Of he, course. Need, he needed those rivals. You need You them. need that because you can't be, he can't be him without those guys. Without those guys, yeah. And it's, it's selfish in the sense where when you take care of his health, that is also selfish because you need him to train. If, you don't, if he's hurt, you can't train with anyone, mm-hmm. right? If your horns are all injured. So, like, there's that, that element of tough love that goes into it. You know, that, you know, some people have two, you know, two minds about that. But to me, tough love is real love. That's the ultimate form of love is being the crap out of your partners because you're trying to teach them. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, man, I appreciate you doing it, bro. Uh, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, and uh, I, really, I really enjoyed the time. It was, it was a good conversation. No, thank you, Elliot. It was a pleasure. Um, I hope that uh, we try to try to stay positive throughout these times. I, I, sometimes I can be a little realistic bordering on negative, but I'm trying to keep it positive on my end. I hope that people listening, you know, feel the same way and, or, you know, asking just, for change isn't negative or asking for something different sometimes, right. Or, or yeah. giving a different perspective. I, I, I don't always find that negative and I found that you delivered it very well. You weren't, you didn't, you didn't say that this is bad or this is good. Right. It was like, look, this is an aspect. We're all going through an aspect of jujitsu. So I didn't find it negative at all, you know? So, um, okay. Well, I appreciate, appreciate it, man. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for having me on. And, uh, well, you know, extending the invitation, uh, yeah. to everyone, you know, to you and everyone, if you're ever in Vegas, once this madness is over, we can get back on the mats. You guys are more than welcome. You know, What's, visit tell, just, in, just in case I would tell if, they, if people don't know, and they're listening, tell them where they can reach you, like Instagram, wherever's the best place. And then the name of the school and all that stuff. Um, well, it's, it's called, you know, you, if you Google Drysdale Jiu Jitsu, will come up, but I've re- rebranded it Zenith by Robert Drysdale. So more in accordance with the team brand, but you know, if you just Google Drysdale Jiu Jitsu, will come up. We're on 2000 South rainbow in Las Vegas. Uh, we have a gym in North Las Vegas on Craig and 95, and we are opening one in Henderson, 1125 American Pacific driveway. So yeah, three locations in Vegas. All right, man. Stay warm, stay safe, bro, and uh, we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thank you, Elliot. You guys have a good one. You too. Ciao.